Here's an interesting way to think about organisms like you. Your body is simply a machine built by your genes for the purpose of making copies of themselves. Obviously that's a really reductionist view of what you are and you can argue against it. But really, I just want you to think about biological life in that way because I want to make a broader point. So stick with me. Go on then. This view of organisms isn't just for humans like you, it applies to all organisms, for example, bacteria. A bacteria cell is simply the vehicle by which the genes of the bacteria make copies of themselves. That fits with the theory of evolution because the genes that make good copying machines are the ones that you tend to see more of. We tend to think of these genetic copies as offspring. For example, the genes that built this machine have successfully copied themselves twice. Well, they successfully copied half of themselves twice. I've got two biological kids is what I'm trying to say. The story is a little bit different in the case of bacteria because bacteria reproduce asexually, but you can still think of it as parent and offspring. So one bacteria cell divides into two. So the single cell was the parent and the two new cells are the daughters. In other words, genes make copies of themselves by making copies of their host organisms. But surprisingly, it's not the only way that genes make copies of themselves. For example, some bacteria cells may have an extra loop of DNA inside them, which is separate to their main genome. It's called a plasmid. And some plasmids contain genes for building something called a sex pillus, which is basically a tube that sticks out from the bacteria. And it'll also have some genes that code for the ability to make a copy of that ring of DNA and push it through the sex pillus into a neighboring bacteria cell. So now this second bacteria cell also has the genes for a sex pillus. The surprising conclusion is that this ring of DNA, this plasmid, is able to make copies of itself independently of the bacteria's normal reproductive cycle by injecting itself into neighboring bacteria. In fact, you can think of this plasmid almost like a separate organism that lives symbiotically inside the bacteria. What's really cool is that this plasmid will sometimes find itself inserted into the main genome of the bacteria cell, and then sometimes it will pop out again. I won't go into the details of why the plasmid pops in and out of the genome because it's, it's just slightly beyond the scope of this video. But the important thing is, when the plasmid um, genes pop out and form a ring, sometimes it'll take a little bit of the bacteria DNA with it. So now this plasmid doesn't just contain genes for making copies of itself, it contains some of the genes from the bacteria. And so when a copy of the plasmid is taken and pushed into a neighboring bacteria through the sex pillus, it takes that little bit of bacterial DNA with it. And so this receiving bacteria now has some DNA that it didn't have before from the sending bacteria. And the chances are it's DNA that it already had because it's swimming round with its relatives. But it might occasionally be swimming near its more distant relatives and it may end up getting, a, getting genes for something that it didn't have before. And it may be that those genes confer an advantage. This mechanism is called bacterial conjugation and it's an example of horizontal gene transfer. So, uh, vertical gene transfer is genes passed from parent to offspring. Horizontal gene transfer is genes passed between neighbours. Like imagine if you shook someone's hand and you got their genes. There are two other main mechanisms for horizontal gene transfer. The first is called transformation. That's when a bacteria cell dies and its membrane and cell wall disintegrate. And then the genome inside starts to crumble as well. It breaks down into smaller pieces that are then floating around. And it may be that there's another bacteria cell floating around as well. And if this bacteria cell has a special skill called competence, then it has a special protein embedded in its boundary with a little bit on the outside, a little bit on the inside. The outside part of the protein is sticky to DNA. So any of this DNA floating around will stick to it. And because this protein is actually a complicated molecular machine, it will then draw this strand of DNA into the bacteria. 
through some mechanism that is partly chemical, partly mechanical, depending on how you look at it. So once again, this bacteria has DNA inside it that it didn't have before. The second mechanism is called transduction and it involves viruses. So when a virus infects a cell, like a bacteria cell, it injects its DNA into the bacteria and it hijacks the molecular machinery of the cell to make copies of itself. Copies are made of the viral DNA, but copies are also made of the various components of that outer protective shell of the virus called a capsid. So you've got all these components of a virus floating around and eventually they're gonna bump into each other and when they do, they snap together and eventually they'll form complete viral particles. I actually already made a video about that process using a clever magnetic model. I'll leave a link to that in the card. At the same time, the host bacteria is dying, so its genome is falling apart into smaller bits of DNA. It's important to know that the process of viral self-assembly is messy. It doesn't always go according to plan, so maybe bits of the outer shell will bump together and they'll snap together in the wrong orientation. And Sometimes maybe you'll get a full virus capsid forming, but instead of viral DNA inside, you have one of these fragments of bacterial DNA inside. Or maybe you'll have a bit of both. When one of these virus particles goes and infects a new bacteria cell, well, it'll inject the bacteria DNA from the original cell into the new cell. And if the bacteria happens to survive the attack, perhaps because this bacterial DNA has replaced the viral DNA or the viral DNA that's in there is malformed, well, then this new bacteria cell has DNA that it potentially didn't have before. Horizontal gene transfer is beneficial in a similar way to sexual reproduction in other organisms. It ensures that there's genetic diversity within a population because it mixes up the genes between individuals. That means that if a new evolutionary selective pressure comes along, like a change in the environment, then hopefully there will be some individuals within the population that are still fit for that changed environment. Horizontal gene transfer also speeds up the process of evolution. Imagine you've got a patient with a staphylococcus infection and a doctor is treating it with antibiotics. Well, these staphylococcus bacteria are mutating all the time. And as always, these mutations are usually harmless or detrimental to the bacteria. But very occasionally, a mutation might confer an advantage like antibiotic resistance. So that the staphylococcus bacteria can continue to grow in spite of the doctor's treatment. A mutation like that is incredibly rare, but imagine instead that there's another bacteria living inside the patient that's completely harmless, and it's only distantly related to Staphylococcus, but it happens to have a gene for antibiotic resistance already. Well, it can pass on that resistance to the Staphylococcus bacteria through horizontal gene transfer. And that is much more common than a mutation. It's much more likely. So the fact that we have these superbugs, these bacterial infections that are resistant to multiple antibiotics is thanks to the sex pillars and the other mechanisms of horizontal gene transfer. Human pathogenic bacteria might not be meeting bacteria with resistance inside the human body. That interaction might be happening somewhere else and in a different way. The truth is no one knows for sure, but I did meet someone who's trying to find out. My name is Professor William Gaze. I work at the University of Exeter Medical School Centre for Environment and Human Health. We might expect it to happen in the environment because that's where most of these environmental bacteria carrying the genes are. And we passage um, human associated bacteria through the environment by introducing you know our own waste into the environment and then you know getting rid of it that way. So there are bacteria living in the environment, environmental bacteria that have nothing to do with humans. They've been living in the environment for millions of years alongside things like penicillium that produces penicillin. So over these millions of years, they've evolved resistance to penicillin and other naturally occurring antibiotics, which are the source of the antibiotics that we produce today. If human pathogenic bacteria were kept separate from these environmental bacteria, we wouldn't have a problem. But then we go to the toilet and then we flush the toilet. We had one of the first and best sewerage systems in the world, but we still effectively are dealing with 
um, something, you know, that infrastructure at its heart. Although, you know, the water industry is investing large amounts of money into dealing with things like um, combined sewer overflows, but it still is an issue that raw sewage can be discharged into the environment. That gives opportunities for interaction with environmental bacteria and gene transfer from that environmental reservoir to those human associated pathogens. So human pathogenic bacteria are potentially picking up their resistance by mixing with environmental bacteria in open water through horizontal gene transfer. But how are these bacteria with these newly acquired skills finding their way back into people? One of my colleagues, Anne Leonard, has estimated that there are millions of exposure events per year that occur in um, bathing waters in England and Wales to resistant E. coli. She also did a study looking at surfers that are, that are exposed to um, potentially polluted water quite often and they, um, they were more likely to carry resistant E. coli in their gut than a control group. The project that we'd, we have been doing for the last four years that is funded by um, NERC is to look at this whole issue of environmental resistance across the whole of the River Thames catchment. That's being done in collaboration with the University of Warwick, uh, Professor Elizabeth Wellington, Dr Chris Quince and um, Dr Andrew Singer at the Centre of Ecology and Hydrology. We collected 200 samples um, over uh, three different time points to look at seasonal variation. And then we extracted all of the DNA that were in those samples. We see a very clear um, relationship between distance from size of and type of wastewater treatment plant but we also do see a signal from animal waste. If you wait until someone comes into a GP or a hospital and presents with an infection with a new type of resistant bacterium it's almost too late to do anything about that because you're not actually addressing the drivers of emergence of those new resistant strains in the first place. We can improve wastewater treatment there are there are significant economic and energy costs to doing that so that's why we need to collect this data to sort of do this cost benefit analysis to work out re you know, really how much we, money we want to invest in improved environmental protection, reduced pollution and therefore the probability that we reduce the rate at which new resistant bacteria emerge. There's an argument that we should be very careful about how we think about this problem which we're saying is one of the biggest problems to face humanity. So there you go. I blame the surfers. This video was made possible by my patrons on Patreon and the Natural Environment Research Council. Thanks, Council. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time.